see your mother. You were only given one. Go see your mother. And you know that you will never have another. Go see your mother. Go see your mom. Welcome to Jewish Food Calls His Mother. I'm your host, Sadia, and this is my mother, Ima. Hey, Ima. Hello, my sweetness. Boy, it doesn't seem to matter. Put on the shadow, put on makeup. Just just go ahead and blame the uh just blame the video, the yeah. video recording. So I think it's it's the camera. It's the camera. Oh yes, yes, yes. The camera adds 10 pounds and ages you 50. So I have a few questions. And mm -hmm. you could take a pause, by the way, and think about them because I can cut the pauses in post. So mm -hmm. just don't be afraid of thinking. And if we run out of time, we can easily just start anew and, and work it. So take your time with these. I'm not being paid to think. Oh, exactly. That's your problem. If you could relive one day of your life, which would it be? The day that you were born, of course. But we're, we're talking about something <laughs> a little more like none of it. Relive a day. Relive a day in my life. When you were a teenager, when you were a young adult, when you were married with kids. I would like to relive the days um, that I made, like, social faux pas. No, but you can't change it. You have to relive it. You can't change it. No, you have oh, to relive it. I thought the whole purpose of reliving it would be No, to you have to relive the whole it. day. You can't change a thing. Relive the whole day. Mm, the whole day I can't change it. Also, make sure your 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 face is on focus. Thank trying you. to straighten out my wig. Yeah. You like it? We have a whole day. We have a whole day. We have a whole day. The first date with you and Ta. No, maybe. Wedding day. <laughs> Probably wedding day. Probably wedding day, yeah. So it says that the day you're trying to, to relive is the main emotion you're trying to capture. Main emotion. My wedding day was, you know, it was, it was like magical. Mm. It was like when we were driving to the hall, it was beautiful weather. And sun was shining, really nice spring weather. And uh, I couldn't believe it was like surreal. I, said, I can't believe it. I said, I'm going to get married. Wow, is this, is this really is this really happening? So I have another another question. You said something though before when we were talking about the idea of uh, questions to get to know somebody. Getting to know you, getting to know all about you, getting to like you, getting to know you like me. I apologize to our listeners. Um, this wasn't a musical. We did not intend that. <laughs> uh, so if you found a book about your entire life and it tells you the complete truth of every situation from all aspects, what chapter would you choose? This is a perfect question for Erev Yom Kippur. Yeah, so, so what, what chapter would you choose? <laughs> oh my gosh. You finally you... know the truth of something that happened. I like, I, like, um, I like the way I'm living. I like my chapter now because a lot of the Trials and tribulations and pressures of raising a family are, are finished. And this is, it's like, it's interesting how human life goes like the seasons. So they've, um, you know, there's been a lot of literature that's made that analogy. And the fall of your life is basically, that's, if you look at, you know, uh, the seasons, fall is harvest time. In fact, um, years ago, in a lot of the farm communities, many, many years ago, when we were mostly an agrarian nation, usually they would have a big like dance, like a big square dance or a big celebration at um, like towards the end of like, like right after the harvest season. Harvest, like, was, harvest season was basically early fall, like September time and early, Oct and early October. And then around the middle of October, they would have like a big celebration in a lot of the farm communities. In fact, I remember when I was in high school, we would have these dances that, you know, throughout the year. And, and the first dance, one of the first dances they would have would be in like mid-October, early mid-October called the, oh, like Harvest Moon, Harvest Moon Dance. So I have a, it was, my... the, it was usually the, 
the was usually the theme. So, so, so life so life is like you know, when the person gets like towards their senior citizen years, you're basically this is harvest time. You're reaping the fruits of all your efforts. You're seeing your children grow up, get married, raise their families, and you can see how the way you raised your all that effort that you put into raising your children is now paying off in the way you see the way that they're conducting their lives. Assuming that you raise them well, I'm not talking about like a criminal type, neglectful parents or whatever, you know, I'm talking about, you know, decent moral parents who are raising their kids to be, you know, decent law abiding moral individuals, which I hope you guys are. I am. I'm totally legal. So that, that kind of, that's not really the question. Uh, maybe I'm wording it incorrectly. Was there anything in your life that was maybe unresolved that you always wanted to know the truth, but never got around to it? Hmm, that's a very, that's an excellent question. Let me see. I think everybody has periods in their lives. We're looking at maybe their grandparents, parents wondering why their parents made certain decisions for them that they did and never really finding out why. I guess um why some boys broke up with me. That's cute. That's cute. And they would and you know how teenagers are, you know, you try to you know, you go out you go out with these gals guys or these gals and you have a great time and they, you know, they like you and you like them and you're dating and you're having a lot of fun or whatever. And all of a sudden they just stop and you kind of see them and they kind of give you the cold shoulder and you try to ask them, Hey, Hey, what's going on? Like you and I, I, I thought we really had something, you know, nice. What's going on? What's going on now? You And it's like nothing. Don't worry about it. Type yeah. thing. You know, they just like, just totally what's it called ghosting these days. Yes. It's called ghosting yeah. nowadays. There's yeah. a label for it now instead of just doing it. Yeah. Um, uh, you see, in my day, it was called um, the cold shoulder, giving you the brush. That's giving you the brush. <laughs> giving you the brush. We should do it next time. We should talk about some slang next time. So here's a good question that I really like. You find out you're going to die in one hour. You can't have contact <laughs> I don't with have any. <laughs> you, might, you, might, you, might, you, might, you might just listen. Just listen. Just listen. Yes. You, you cannot contact anyone you love. What do you do? You have to sit with that one hour. What do you do? All right. Yeah. Outside of saying vidoy, what do you do? <laughs> okay, for our listening audience who might not be Orthodox Jews or who might not be Jewish, saying vidoy is your personal confession to God Repentance. to forgive you for all your sins. And you, you enumerate um, in this prayer all possible sins. Last will and testament. Yeah. So, but, but what else would you I do? Guess, I guess I'd grab a piece of paper and write a final letter to my children, telling them how much. Nope, no contact. You can't cheat. You, what, what would you, you do? Leave, what if you leave, what if you leave a, a pa what if you leave a paper? Nope, that's Just not leave. how it works. That's not how this question works. You have to sit with the moment and then decide to do something. What do you decide to do? You can't contact anyone. You can't do whatever. Go for a drive. Go to the theme park. Read a good book. Take a bath. What would you do? I would just, like I said, I would, I would have, I would have to dive and just make my peace, peace with make Hashem. Peace. Just live in a peaceful moment. Yeah, okay. I would, I would, I would like to say, say, and I would, um, just say prayers for everyone in my family and myself. And uh, okay, yeah. what's one thing you? Oh, we, we have some better questions. I have some more. I have some more. I have some more. I'll, I'll tell you afterwards. What's one thing you've always wanted to learn to try but haven't yet? Try but haven't yet. Fly a plane. Really? Yeah. I've always, you know, imagined how nice that would be to be up there in the clouds and flying a plane. You know, it must, must, must be nice. It must be like very adventurous. Flying over and like being able to cover all the, the all this amazing terrain of the United States. Actually, I, um, I enjoy flying. And I feel, I feel sorry for those, um, I know many people, I know many people, I'm very close to a couple people who it's really sad. They're extre they are so nervous with flying. They hate flying. They're very, very nervous. And as a matter of fact, they even have to take, uh, they have to take medication like tranquilizers before they get on an airplane. 
Was and uh, I, I enjoy. In fact, I enjoyed the takeoff. I, I find like this adrenaline rush with the takeoff. When I was a kid, and I went to like the amusement parks. When I was a kid, I used to. Oh my gosh, I used to go on every crazy wild ride. I mean, these days I can't. I just I can't go any wild rides. I mean, I'm you no. Know, but I remember as the ride was taking off, feeling that adrenaline rush. And I feel the same adrenaline rush when I'm on an airplane and taking that takeoff. There was one woman sitting near me who was so nervous about the takeoff. The entire takeoff, she she sat with her knees up to her head and her arms, like totally hiding her head with her arms behind her knees and not looking. Oh, wow. I felt so sorry for that poor woman. I said, here, this is such an adventure. And, you know, and it's, it's sad that you can't uh, get over uh, nervousness i can feel sometimes i wonder if i wonder if a lot of these fears are biological and genetic sometimes i wonder well there's generational trauma generational well, ptsd well my my mother and i was listening to a program about fear of swimming and they were talking about that and they said they have found that that is not necessarily related to any type of trauma that is actually it's actually a genetic biological thing. And um, my mother was always terrified of swimming. Always. She was, she just couldn't do it. And I know somebody who um, also, and this woman tried everything she could to overcome this fear. She even took swimming in college. And the swimming instructor tried working with her and working with her and working with her and working with her. And she could not bring herself to even put her face in the water. Wow. No matter how, no matter, and the instructor did every trick in the book. So the instructor said, you know, because you work so hard, I'm going to pass you with the sink because I could see how hard you were working. And she just could never get over that fear. So if you could live anywhere in the world for a year, where would it be and why? Oh, Israel, of course. That's what I kind of figured too. Yeah. I yeah. have the same thing, that same thought process. Very spiritual. I, you know, well, I've been to Israel three times. Yeah. And um, the people, you know, everyone says that the spirituality of Israel is something otherworldly, something mystical. I remember one of my, my first trip to Israel, um, the whole group of students were sitting in the youth hostel, and we were all exchanging the, basically, stories of, things that have ha had happened on our trips and amazing things that we had seen and done. And not everybody in the group was Jewish. In fact, a lot of people in the group were not Jewish. And one of the boys, I don't think he was Jewish, said, said that he has seen so many amazing mystical things in this country. He said, I will believe anything I hear about this country. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, I remember being in Israel and, and having these moments of thinking about like just always randomly finding someone like if I told them I'm going to the Kotel, I mm -hmm. knew I would meet them, even though the Kotel is a big place and there's a lot of people I knew without a doubt that I will meet the person I need to meet. And it happened all the time, every time. I have actually run in Israel, run into neighbors of mine who I hadn't seen in years. Well, that's funny. And saw them in the old city. What is one of the most meaningful experiences you've ever had? Raising you, of course. I understand the <laughs> biasness, but we need a more direct answer. Gosh, meaningful experiences. Meaningful, meaningful experiences. Meaningful, 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 meaningful. I have to say, um, while we're on the subject and Yom Kippur's coming up, I remember when I went to my first year, I lived in Crown Heights and davened by the Rebbe at 770. Oh. And how powerful that davening was for Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. I mean, you're talking about a thousand men all singing Avinu Malkeinu together. Wow. Yeah, Imagine how powerful thing. those voices were with the Rebbe. Yeah, that's intense. Wow, that was, yes. That was very intense. And then there was the Sukkot before I met your father, Sukkot Chalamoy, when just be, I was about to take the subway to Port Authority to take the bus to ba Baltimore to spend some time in Baltimore for Sukkot Chalamoy and the last two days of Yantuf. And I decided before I would 
go on the subway, I would go to 770 in there with, at the Rebbe's Minion. And how when I came in, like payment to the women's section, I saw the Rebbe as he was standing behind his stender. When I came in, I was like parallel to where the Rebbe was. And the Rebbe pulled back his talus and looked right up at me. Wow. And that was, that was the uh, circus when um, your father and I went on our first date. Well, wow, that's cool. Interesting. What do you think people misunderstand about you the most? Hmm. Misunderstand about me. That I'm really very nice. Why would they think otherwise? Yeah. I think I have some children that uh, have that various opinions of me. <laughs> I don't think they, exactly. people, people will never deny that you're not nice. Nice. And you know, please forgive me for any mistakes. I made raising you. I was. I think topics is the issue. Stuff and uh, you know, all that stuff. I, what every parent, but what most parents think. Yeah. Well, I think it's also it's the idea. It's like you know, it's it's this. I think your ADHD is something that yes. really stopped you from a lot of things. Or if you got maybe proper medication, there would have been different. But time. it really, really shot you in the foot. That's yeah. at least that's yeah. how I see it. I was very. Um, I was. Still am today to a certain extent. I mean, my social skills, Baruch Hashem, my social skills have improved a lot, you know, over the years. But there were some things I said, not, not meaning that, not meaning them to be mean or nasty, but because of the way I worded them, they were taken the wrong way. Yeah. And you try That's to, you know, to we, we had that one time we're talking about, and trying to explain yourself, and it's like, so that's another th topic I wanted to think about today. Um, I, went, I was talking to somebody about uh, the difference between innocent teasing, like having just a little bit of fun, and actual outright bullying. Interesting. And the differences between the two. And because there have been times where, especially growing up, especially as a teenager or as a young kid, where people said things to me and I took it as bullying and yeah. knock them or beat them up or threw things at them. And people around me told me, hey, you know, you're you're taking these things much too much personally. too you're taking this much too personally because they were just teasing you a little bit. They didn't really mean anything but but I, you know, for me it was personal. And there was even an incident. Um I mean I've I've gotten better about a lot better about that as years have gone on. But there was an incident I remember where this girl in our carpool, and I was driving Base Yakov Carpool many years ago got into our van and asked if she could sit in a certain seat by the door. And I said, yes, that's a very special seat. Yes, you may sit there. And um, your sister jokingly said, only the there are only very special people sit there, you know, and everybody started laughing. We all thought, no one, we were not attacking her. We were not putting her down. We just were having a little, you know, innocent fun. Well, her mother called me up that night. Ho, ho, ho. You destroyed my daughter. She came in and burst into tears and ran into her room. And you were the <laughs> and your daughter is so rude. You were the nastiest people on the. I go, I, I, I told, so I told her what we said. I said, please. I said, we weren't attacking your daughter. We were just you know, joking around a little bit. And she goes, well, my daughter didn't take it like that. No, no, no. Yeah, that's happened to me a couple of times where, like, I was joking around or asking questions and. I do a lot of shock humor back in my early, early days. And I would always ask like random questions and I just would think it's funny. And most guys would get my humor and think it's hilarious and come along with it. There was one time I was at a bar with my college friends and we were all celebrating our final thesis and we're all done. And I joked around with everybody just asking stupid questions and asked this one stupid question of like, like, just as a joke, we were all getting drunk. We we're all just asking. They're just being fools. And I'm like, oh, are you cut? Like, are you circumcised? Like, just as a joke about something. I don't know how the conversation came about. And everyone started laughing. And we all started cracking up. And uh -huh. the British the British guy who was there got very offended. was very mad at me. I'm like, how dare you ask me that question? How dare you? I'm like, I'm sorry. I was just joking around, man. Like, chill. Like, it's fine. Like, whatever. And it just turned into a massive like huge fight i had to like calm him down we had other friends like calm him down and like like whoa this this just escalated crazy you, know, you never know what you've touched in some people like one time like you know i get very dark during the summertime yeah and this was summertime 
and I was in college. And my piano teacher and I, the piano teacher I had in college, he and I became very good friends. It wasn't just a, you know, it wasn't just a student, you know, a professor relationship. We we became very good friends. And he was a married man with kids and everything. But, you know, we used to talk to each other a lot, talk about our problems, whatever. So one day I see him sitting there in the student cafeteria. And he really looks upset. And I come over and I say, is everything okay? And he says, he says, yeah, I'm just disturbed about what some people are saying. So for a joke, because, you know, he and I were close friends and I was so dark, I said to him, you just like dark complexion people. And he looks at me, what's that supposed to mean? So I said, well, he was white Anglo. He was very, very white. You know, he's from, yeah. he, was from, he was from the West. He was from Oregon. And he was very, very blonde hair, blue, white, green, light, and white Anglo. And I said, well, you're light and I'm dark. That's all I was, that's all I was joking around about. And he goes, did you hear the rumor? I go, what rumor? Somebody started a nasty rumor that he was having a relationship with one of the black music teachers. Whoa. I, and I, I was, I go, I said, no, I told, and he, he, and he, thank God he, he took my answer for real, which it was. It was sincere. I was not lying. He took it. You know, he realized that I was talking honestly. I said, this is the first I'm hearing of this. What happened? And he told me about, he told me about the rumor. I said, that's such a thing. That's horrible. Hmm? What happened in the end? It blew over. And thank wow. God, I don't think his, his wife, I think also did not take it seriously. She, she thought it was just some nasty person that was just trying to, you know, Stir up trouble. She, you know, Interesting. She, you know, she realized that some somebody was somebody who was just this very nasty person who was just trying to stir up trouble for him for some reason. When was the last time you changed your mind about something important? About two minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> waka 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 waka. Oh, but this is well, this is one of these strange days where you know last night we were all hunkering down here in um, Boynton because. You know, the hurricane came through the west coast of Florida. And even though it wasn't hitting us directly, you never know with the outer bands whether you're going to get, you know, tornadoes. Also, hurricanes can change their path without warning very, very quickly. So there's, you know, the, they I mean, they predicted the hurricane moved just as they predicted. It moved through the west coast and it went straight up northeast. Oh, wow. And so our part, Southern Florida, uh, thank God, didn't really suffer that much. I mean, I, I put, I attached my, um, I have those accordion shutters. So I thought to be on the safe side, I'm just going to pull these accordion shutters because even, you know, you never know with the high winds. And last night, yeah, I heard some branches and things striking my, striking my hurricane shutters. So it was a good thing I pulled them shut. And this morning I get up and the house is, even with the hurricane shutters, is like, light is it sunny outside what's going on so i open up one of my hurricane shutters the one that i have a couple that open and close from the inside and most of them though are the outside so i open up the one that's from the inside beautiful sunshiny weather whatever well, anyway so what happened well the when i woke up when i first woke up at first i didn't know what a beautiful sunshine day it was going to be and i figured what's well, the sense of rushing out of bed I'll just take my time. I'll lay here. I'll rest. It's probably raining outside. You know, where am I going to go? What am I going to do? And when I finally dragged myself out of bed at mid morning, mid morning, yeah, and opened up the show, no rain, beautiful sky, sunshine, nice, nice breeze. Yeah, it's been beautiful weather. So, um, so I thought to myself, well, maybe I know my car needs some maintenance work. And so I thought, well, maybe I could call the dealership and see if there's cancellations for the day, take care of it today, whatever. So I called the dealership and there was no one answering, no receptionist, nobody was answering the phone. So then I figured, okay, you know, just uh, take my time to stop. And then I get a call, a text message from one of my piano students. Hey, you know, can you come to our house and see if you can give a piano lesson? Sure. And then you called, hey, let's do the podcast. Yeah, let's do Yeah. Because I'm thinking to myself, and I had planned a day where I was going to go swimming. I'm going to play piano. I'm just going to, you know, not go swimming probably. I thought I was going to stay inside the whole day. But it was probably raining and howling outside. Play piano, play violin. You know. 
just have more of a lazy day and now it's like all this yeah. stuff to do what's something you've done that you're really proud of but don't get talked about often I got a lot of my daughters admire me for it. Thank God having multiple births with no anesthesia, <laughs> especially when I complain about, especially when I complain about being terrified of needles. You bet you're terrified of needles. You're terrified. I honestly, no joke. One of, one of Ruthie's friends just gave birth and she's terrified of needles. So she's, she gave birth naturally. And that's, yeah, it's just, <laughs> Funny thing, the way it goes. Um, I would do anything to avoid that epidural, unless it was unless it was God forbid a C-section. And okay. What's your idea of a perfect day? The day. Yeah. <laughs> Today's no, a, day, a day when I'm active. You know what I mean? I'm the type of person. Yeah. You are too, probably. That there are people that I guess that we're um, they're we're like pit bulls. Pit bulls have to, you know, pit bulls are the type of dog that need to be active or they'll tear up the place. You know, so, um, yeah, so having an know, active day, just like there, what kind of activity? People, I can work. I like, I like, um, I like where I'm working, working, then afterwards giving piano lessons, um, just having a very active. I remember one day in college where after class, um, I had a job that night. I was working out, know, um, behind a deli counter. And I finished with my, I finished with classes and I'm in the car. I'm driving to my job. I'm thinking, this is the life, school and work. I love it. Yeah, I feel the same way. I was listening once to Michael Savage and he said, he was complaining about going on vacation. That's funny. He said, I hate vacations. He says, sit around. I says, I says, I've got to be active. He says, even on his vacation, he still broadcasts. He still, you know, writes, he still writes articles. He said, he just cannot. He, he could not go on vacation. But, so if you had to teach a class on oh, something. I'm doing one more thing about yes. bullying. I yes. was talking to um, one of my sons-in-laws. We were talking about, he, he, he teases me sometimes. And one of his teasing that he likes to do is about me getting old. He called me up. He says, listen, he says, are you, he says, tell me the genes. He says, um, I hope I didn't offend you. He says, when I tease you about getting old. And I go, no, I, I think it's funny. I said, I think, I think it's really a sequel. So we were, we were actually, we were talking about this topic about mm. bullying. And he says, there's something in the Gemara about the difference between bullying and teasing. He says, teasing is when both people laugh. Just joking around, having, having innocent fun, having innocent teasing is when all parties laugh. It's when one of the parties does not laugh that it crosses the line into bullying. I think the di difference too is bullying is when you, really intend to cut this person down and to make them feel horrible intentionally. This is like, that's your goal. But if your goal isn't to really cut the other person down and make them feel horrible, if your goal is to maybe just joke around a little bit, even to make them laugh, you know, about the, some aspect of themselves or yourself or whatever, then, you know, that's, that's the difference. In fact, there was this one black comedian, I forgot who it was, where one of the black leaders really criticized him about his humor. He said that he felt his humor was degrading to the black community because a lot of his jokes were about basically funny things that go on in the black community. You know, like different shortcomings that are kind of funny. And this black comedian said, hey, if you can't laugh at yourself, who can you laugh about? He says, you've got to be a mentally healthy person is able to laugh at himself. Like, think about how many funny, you know, mistakes you made, funny things you did. Uh, maybe you were klutzy. Maybe you said this wrong, that wrong, and you kind of laugh at yourself. Oh, boy, yeah, that was, that was, that was kind of stupid and funny of me in this, at the same time. Like, I know I'm klutzy, which is why I will not have a gun. I will not own a gun. Maybe I shouldn't put that out there. You want something funny? I was talking to a security guard, I saw a sign in front of a building where it says, no guns or weapons beyond this point. And I said to the security guard, that has got to be the stupidest sign to hang on a building. You have just told every single bad guy or bad gal that they can come into this building, shoot up the place, and no one will be there to stop them. So the security guard, so some guy who was passing by us who heard the conversation, and the security guard agreed with me. 
yeah, that was a pretty stupid sign to put up. So some man walking by me says, yeah, what they should really put up is everyone in this building is armed. Smith and Weston live here. If you had to teach a class, if you got to teach a class on something, anything, really, uh, what would you teach? Anything. Imagine it. Not that, you're, not that you're certified in or anything like that, just something that you can, you've had a passion about or you're thinking of or... Uh, riflery. Gunnery. <laughs> yeah? Although I, I've, my experience with guns has been very normal. I mean, I have had, I have shot a gun, but um, I would really... You know, guns are in the, guns are a, um, a, how can I say it, a reality of American life. And far from running from them in a way, I, as a matter of fact, I think that gun safety um, should be taught in high school. It really should, because a lot of the accidents and things that happen with guns are amateurs who have not had proper training. Just, you know, I mean, you hear these stories about, in fact, it happened in my neighborhood of a man who he saw in the dark. He saw somebody in the kitchen in the dark, like a figure, and he shot at it. It turned out to be his own daughter who was just going to the kitchen to get something to drink. And one of the things, I don't know, like I said, I'm not a gun expert, but common sense would tell me, don't shoot at any target until you identify it. Yeah. You know, turn on a light, turn on a flashlight, find out, you know, and I've heard some horrible stories about, yeah, we hear horrible stories all the time about people shooting family members in the dark because they, you know, didn't properly identify them. I mean, you know, like I said, you know, and, and the gun, a gun safety course would teach people how to have respect for guns. A lot of people are not aware of the power of guns. We, there was an incident in, in uh, Baltimore at Lock Raven, at the, par, uh, the woods of Lock Raven many years ago, of a girl. I mean, she and her friends, these were good students, no previous uh, running with the law, no previous record. And they got a hold of their parents' guns, and they thought they would go into the woods and just shoot at some targets, shoot at the trees, not realizing how powerful these bullets are. And one of the bullets, a stray bullet, went off into the beltway and hit a woman in the passenger seat, a young woman who was pregnant in the passenger seat. Now, a gun safety course would have taught these kids one important rule that you'll ask anybody who's a gun expert. Every bullet has an address. And there, when you shoot off a bullet, it just doesn't go up in the air and land someplace, whatever, you know. It's going to go. It's going to go somewhere, and it can very possibly kill somebody. Especially, there are some guns who, if you were to shoot a bullet at the end of a block, it would go through every single house in that block, so stopping at the end of the block. How many people are aware of this? Most people aren't. They just think, "Oh, take the gun to shoot it." You really need to have some education as to what guns are about to learn to them. Okay, now that you're done with that, what's something you're afraid of but want to overcome? This is a very powerful speech. Sounds fantastic, Ema. No one wants a speech. The um, NRA would be proud of me. That's fantastic, Ema. The uh, NRA would be very proud of you. And I am too, Ema, for being my mother. Oh, what's something you're afraid that's of? That's a nice but... thing to say here of Yum Kipper. Fantastic, Ema. I just need to get through this one question, and I think that's it. We are running out of time. What's something you're afraid of but want to overcome? Woo. That's a real good one. Um, needles. It packs yeah. needles. <laughs> I love it. So needles. You would love to over overcome needles. Yeah. So I was watching something on YouTube where they, um, the etymologist was rating stings as far as like at insects mm -hmm. uh, were concerned. And he had like a whole chart showing insects and reptiles that either sting or bite and rating the pain of the sting and what insects or what reptiles give the most horrible sting and what give the lightest sting. Interesting. Interesting. And he says, believe it or not, honeybees don't rate that high, but what rates very, very high are yellowjack. So 
we got one minute left, but I got one question left. What's a book, movie, or song that has deeply impacted you? Um, it's really impacted me. <laughs> all right. It's all right. Uh -huh. any, any... I've gone, I've gone with the wind. Gone with, gone with the wind affected a lot of people, especially girls. Yeah, how so? Because the, the character of Scarlett O'Hara being um, a very intelligent go-getter, but having that mean streak about her that she does is not able to overcome until um, until the end of the book when it's too late, when she, because of her, I guess, of a certain level of meanness or selfishness and not letting go. I guess like all girls have this fantasy of they have, they have crushes, like teenage crushes. And by the time she gets old enough in her late 20s to realize that this feeling that she has for Ashley is just a crush and how, because of her selfishness, how many people's lives she actually affected in, in a bad way by the time she realized. Thank you for listening to Jewish Boy Calls His Mother. Please comment and subscribe on our Facebook page, YouTube channel, and Instagram. I would greatly appreciate it, and my mother would too.